Everybody's already excited, I know. I know I am too. And I'm too, and I've already seen uh, Doug talk, so I know how excited you'll be even after the talk. So this is a, a, a really, really happy to have you all here. Uh, this is another event of the Hacking XR Speaker Series. For those of you who are new to the series, welcome. I hope for the others you've had a great spring break. Uh, the series, for those of you who don't know it, uh, is held uh, throughout the semester. It's held as in conjunction with the class Hacking XR, which I teach here at MIT, and the MIT Open Documentary Lab, where storytellers, artists, and technologists come together to think about the future of nonfiction. In our class, we think about the future of storytelling and using new technologies, mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, but to think about the future of these new languages we're using and new ways of thinking about the ways we use technology to tell stories or tell parts of the way we imagine our reality, sometimes we need to learn from masters and sometimes we need to step a little bit back. So think of this today like a special master class that we have uh, for the speaker series. And I'm saying master class because we are very honored to have with us somebody who's been visiting for maybe 50 years, uh, the future of what would be the way we talk about our lives, our imaginations, and the future of storytelling. I'm very, very honored to have with us as a special guest today, Doug Trumbull. And there's a, quite a list to talk about what Doug has been doing, so I'm going to take my little paper to help me make sure that I, you know, I know exactly what lines to drop so you are all in awe because you already know these lines. Uh, but still, Doug is an immersive media pioneer. He's a filmmaker and a visual effect visionary, but we owe him the special effect of real landmarks. If I say 2001 Space Odyssey, you of course Yes, of course, yes, that's why we're here. Uh, but also, uh, Close Encounter of the Third Kind, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Blade Runner, he directed Brainstorm and Silent Runnings. What I had forgotten about, he also wrote, produced, and directed Back to the Future of the Ride for Steven Spielberg and Universal Theme Parks. He is the recipient of an Academy Award for Scientific and Technical Achievement, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Cinematographer, and I'll let you explain, Doug, a little bit about your vision for the future of cinema, which are, you're still working on uh, as we speak today. So this is really something that's helping us envision the way we will imagine the future. And sometimes that imagination is what drives what we make of it. So I'd like you to all give a very special welcome to Doug Trumbull. Thank you. Thank you. Are you OK on the mic? Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Sandra. Um, and uh, I'm not going to list the Open Documentary Lab and the XR hacking, because you just did. And um, this is probably going to take about two hours. I hope it goes well. I've never perfectly timed it out. And we did it. Sandra was up in Montreal when we did this at the Future of Storytelling Conference. And I did about an hour of it. And I still had an hour to go. But I, they bumped me off the stage, because that's all the time I had. So I promised to do the whole thing which was very frustrating to have it truncated. But anyway, this is the entire show uh, that's a culmination of 50 years of experience in movies. And um, I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. Uh, Sandra named this event uh, Memories of the Future of Immersion Tomorrow. And I'll do my best to make sense out of that. <laughs> and um, when I was very young, I, I, was, I was fascinated with movies. I was fascinated with animation. I used to watch these Disney shows every Sunday night, all about how movies were made, and how animation was performed, and how Disneyland was created. And I got completely entranced by all that stuff. But I was also watching uh, Cinerama movies on these gigantic curved uh, screens. And I'll explain that as we go on. So uh, the kind of theme of what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, that there's this convergence going on right now. And that's, I think, why this event is so timely, in that there's, there's a world of filmmaking and there's a world of theater, of telling stories and performing arts and music and drama and opera and all kinds of things. But there's this simultaneous world of augmented reality, theme park attractions, and all kinds of other immersive experiences. And they will converge sometime in the very near future. And I'm trying to help that along. Because I think they need each other. And I see that the, the whole world of virtual reality and augmented reality kind of represents um, 
my idea that people crave immersion. It's all, it's all a part of theater and drama. Doug Trumbull is a man with an idea. And the idea is that movies could look more realistic and be more involving than well, they are. Hi, I'm Doug Trumbull. When I was growing up, I was entranced with movies. I loved the giant screen spectacle of Cinerama and admired the directors who worked in this fantastic medium, drawing audiences into amazing and almost overwhelming immersive experiences. The Cinerama screens were 90 feet wide and you felt surrounded by the deeply curved image. When George Marshall directed the train sequence in How the West Was Won, I was amazed at how he managed to adapt his directorial style to the ultra-wide three-camera Cinerama. When David Lean made Lawrence of Arabia in 70mm Super Panavision, I was convinced that powerful dramatic stories could be told on the giant screen. My first experience working on a 70mm giant screen movie was as an illustrator on the Cinerama 360 degree dome screen movie To the Moon and Beyond for the New York World's Fair. It was like a planetarium with a movie instead of the sky. It was seen by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke confirming their belief that they could make what Stanley called the first good science fiction movie, also saying that he felt an obligation to make 2001 A Space Odyssey to be how the universe was won. So the kind of theme I'm going to talk about tonight is how that relates and how deeply I was affected by working with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, which was an immersive experience. It was designed for Cinerama. It was designed for these giant 90-foot wide screens. And he felt a big obligation or responsibility to make an immersive movie and a spectacle kind of like David Lean and like many of the other great film directors, uh, John Ford and others, who were trying to make epic spectacles for the giant screen, what they call the silver screen. And um, so that profoundly affected me. I'm going to take you all through why I've been driven to do what I do. So storytelling and experience making seem to be two different things, and I'm trying to figure out how to bring them together. Because if you're telling a story, you can have actors talk, you can have dialogue, you can have interaction, tension, uh, drama, suspense, emotion, all the things that are movies are made out. But experience making is very uh, profoundly immersive and isn't necessarily about people talking. It's about giving the audience a direct experience of some Thing, whatever it is, whatever the experience is. And those things are hard to pull together. They're very hard to pull off. And I'll tell you a little about how I've been, how I've been working on that. So um, the movie industry is a very mature art form. I think it actually peaked out in about 1950 or the mid-50s. And it's not been developing further much since then. And is there a problem? And yeah, sure, there's a problem because we're now seeing a tremendous uh, disruption of the movie industry uh, as a result of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon making movies for television, which are designed for streaming. They're usually episodic, long-form storytelling. And the, the, the movie studios just do not know what to do. They either have to abandon ship or join them. And so many of the studios are actually starting their own streaming services, while some studios may stick it out and say, no, we're only here to make movies for theaters, period. And then you've got the opposite side, which is like Netflix trying to qualify for an Academy Award by showing a Netflix movie in a movie theater for two weeks to qualify. So there's a lot of dynamics going on. And the big question is, will movies and theaters survive? And if so, what do we have to do to make sure it does survive? And how can we offer a more and powerful differentiating experience in movie theaters so that people will prefer the theater or choose to go to a theater instead of watching a movie on this? You know, this is not giant screen and this is not immersive. So um, it's not that I'm against it. It's a perfectly good business and it's a legitimate way to tell stories, but it's not, I think, the future of immersive cinema. So certainly people have experimented with immersive cinema for many years and Abel Gantz was one of the first people to go there with his uh, triptych um, uh, three camera, three projector system for uh, uh, Napoleon. Uh, then Cinerama came along a little bit later, and Cinerama actually was derived from an earlier flight training simulator. It was a gunnery training system that was five projectors and five screen, five seamlessly blended images on a dome screen 
for gunnery trainers to figure out how to aim uh, machine guns at the enemy. And they think that that technology saved about 250,000 lives in World War II. It became Cinerama. They just got rid of two of the projectors and limited it back to three. It became Cinerama. And then that was followed by single projector, single camera, 70 millimeter. In order to simplify the production technology, and I'll show you a little video about how tr troubling it was. Um, and then there was Cinerama 360 much later, which was what I worked on for this, this film for the New York World's Fair, To the Moon and Beyond. So I grew up on Cinerama when I was very impressionable. And Cinerama was this deeply curved wide screen with three projectors, three cameras, kind of blended together. We do that now digitally much better, but in the old days they did it very poorly. And one of the things that Cinerama was about was peripheral immersion of having the screen very wide. And they discovered that having it very wide created this sense of immersion. So I hope this little video that will play. It suddenly dawned on the secret to depth perception emotion in front of you, but the peripheral vision that you see on the side. And that was really when it all came together. That was a little sitter on the test screen from long ago. So when I got this job working on New York, New York World's Fair film, it was circular. We were projecting into a planetarium dome of 70 millimeter film, projected straight up with a fisheye lens. And we had to shoot straight up with a fisheye lens. And then we had to do animation and other things, which I was doing. So I was doing planets and galaxies and things that were all kind of multiplane photography and they were all done on this 70 millimeter circular film format in the old days so we're not doing this all digitally now but I wanted to show you a little bit about the challenges of working in an oddball medium which is kind of like VR so there were a lot of problems with actors and directors working in this very strange medium called Cinerama because the field of view was so wide that it was very hard to do a close-up. You couldn't put the camera close enough to get a close-up. So you had to shoot these shots with two or three actors in the shot at once. If you did do a close-up, it was very disturbing to the actors because they couldn't look at the other actor. They were told to look right at a certain point on the lens of the camera in order to seem to be looking at another actor. That was part of the trick. And I'm just going to show this video because it speaks for itself. The directors for the Cinerama pictures were under orders to really make attempts to show off the process. Uh, it was tremendously exciting and frightening, but I mean the wonderful thing about Cinerama was the fact that you really felt enveloped by it. Each of the directors had the problems with the format. They were not used to it. It was different. The, the size of the cameras, the complexity of them, the fact that there were three pieces of film going at the same time bothered all of them, and they were certainly not used to composing the action to the camera's problems rather than uh, to what they saw as the uh, flow of the picture. You know, when you're watching an Indian attack and there's a point of view shot, you're riding with those Indians as they're making their charge, and then the camera rises up. It's very exciting. And that's just one, that's just one shot of many. The camera is this big. And when you speak to the, your fellow actor, you can't. You'll only hear his lines. You have to look straight in the camera like a third in. And you pretend that that's whoever you're supposed to be looking at. That was very difficult. It was very hard because your co-star is way over in the mountains saying the lines and you're looking at him here. Why, for you, childbearing had come as easy as rolling off a log. Well, I... Think I'd rather roll off a log, Mr. Morgan. So when um, Mad Mad World came out, which was a movie that was uh, heavily advertised as being in Cinerama, uh, it was actually the first single lens Cinerama movie. Uh, and 2001 and, and the later pictures that everybody thought were in Cinerama were really in this single lens process, which was allowed them to be much more fluid and essentially make the films <laughs> in a somewhat more cinematic way. Uh, they were projected on a curved screen, so I think they lost something when they gave up the three projector system, but they gained a lot of flexibility and the ability to make the pictures, and I, I think probably the later pictures are, are better because of them. And now, your journey. 
is just beginning. I think it's important to note that even though Cinerama is no longer with us today, Cinerama is there in the kinds of films we see. It, Cinerama created a widescreen revolution, um, and we're still looking at widescreen films. Every film that's, that's shown on American screens today is in some ways indebted to the kind of transformation of motion picture experience that Cinerama engineered. Okay, so that's a bit of history that relates to virtual reality. Because as you all know, how many people here are working on virtual reality or augmented reality? Oh, okay. How many people here are filmmakers or film students? Okay. Um, so this is the crossover between these two worlds. And they were facing it back in the 50s when this was done. And we're still facing it today. Because in VR, you can often have a whole bunch of cameras in a sphere uh, looking in every conceivable direction, look up, down, around, and where does the director stand? Where does the cinematographer stand? Where is the voice coach for the actor or actress? And so there's a lot of those complexities that attend to VR and AR right now that they faced years ago, and they're the, actually the same kinds of problems and the same challenges. And so this whole presentation tonight is about what I'm trying to do and try, what I'm trying to find as a new medium that brings those fabulous uh, attributes of, of cinema, drama, storytelling, action, and adventure into an immersive experiential thing for audiences to see. So um, this was Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke, and this is where I connected with them on 2001 uh, at this To the Moon and Beyond film in New York. And 2001 A Space Odyssey was a complete gas to work on. Stanley Kubrick was an amazing genius. Uh, he's often spoken about as a very eccentric and difficult guy, but I got along just great with him. And I became a very important part of solving fundamental problems for immersive experiences. Because he was pushing the envelope of the cinematic language. And when I talk about the cinematic language, I'm talking about the way stories are told, which is to have an establishing shot of the whole group, a close-up of these three people, a reverse on Hal, or a close-up of Sandra, and they talk to each other, and you go to over the shoulder shots in reverse. You can see this all day, every day, on at least a thousand channels of television. That's the cinematic language. If you want to change that cine cinematic language into something that's more immersive, you've got to get back to a much bigger immersive screen. You've got to do all kinds of things that I'm going to talk about here. But anyway, here is shooting inside the centrifuge on 2001 with a gigantic fisheye lens that's this big around. It's looking out almost 180 degrees. And there's a lot of shots in the movie that are shot with that lens. This is me when I look better, um, working on lunar landscapes for Stanley Kubrick and developing the whole lunar surface, uh, which was you know just one of the many, many tasks that we had to figure out was what was the moon going to look like. We wanted to get as close to it as we could. We missed the boat a little bit, but it came out OK. And it's not as, cr the real moon is not as craggy as this. This was influenced by a famous uh, illustrator named Chesley Bonestell. And I just worked on a documentary film about Chesley Bonestell called Chesley Bonestell, A Brush with the Future. He was a futurist illustrator in the same caliber as uh, Maxfield Parrish or uh, um, Norman Rockwell. But his, his interest was in painting the future of science fiction and planets. And he had this incredibly vivid imagination. So that led to these craggy mountains. And I had a big argument with Kubrick about it. He said, no craggy mountains. So, so we compromised. This was a way to take a 200-pound camera and rotate it. There's a lot of really complicated stuff in this movie. And I have a whole other keynote, which I'm not going to do tonight, about how the movie was made. This is an interesting shot because this is inside the centrifuge. And that's Stanley Kubrick on the left, and that's me with my back to the camera. It's Keir DeLay and Gary Lockwood and some of the other members of the crew. And on the table are two iPads. 
Now, the, we didn't have iPads when we made this movie. We had nothing electronic. We had no digital screens, no flat screens, no nothing. We all projected movies into, into rear projection screens. So we bored holes in the table and projected the movie from the floor to make these synthetic iPads. Many, many years later, I don't know, maybe 10 or more years ago, we started developing the idea of a documentary film about the making of 2001, which I thought was really worth doing. Because a lot of people say, well, how the heck was that movie made? What was the story behind the making of the movie? So I wanted to make this movie. And I made a proposal to Warner Brothers, who owned the rights. They bought the MGM library. So they own MGM, for, own 2001. So I'm going to show you a little clip from this documentary that never got made. It's just a taste of a documentary, a hypothetical documentary. And if, I'm, if I can live to see this through, I will get this documentary made some way or another. Or maybe not, but we'll see. been going after all these 40 years? Everything is going extremely well. You know, Dave Larson and I are working on a documentary about the making of the movie. We've got all these photographs, just incredible stuff, the behind the scenes production. May I see them? Sure. Like there's a, a early moon watcher. And you hold it a bit closer. Sure, hold on. There's an early design for the Discovery spacecraft. Get the Super Panavision Cinerama camera. Kubrick and Clark. As you know, Dave Larson's been researching the making of 2001 for over nine years. He's interviewed over 190 people associated with the film in many ways. We have the transcripts of those interviews. So those transcripts are now guiding us in a whole new series of interviews that we will shoot in high definition. Dave has found in the Kubrick archives beautiful, very large format ectochrome transparencies of every major set in the movie. They're like they were shot yesterday. They are not degraded, they're not faded. They're in beautiful condition, and you're seeing some of them right now. And we're going to shoot every interview of at least 40, 45 people. All of the interviews will be shot with a green screen like this so that we can put images behind the interviewee. We hope to use a widescreen, uh, two-to-one aspect ratio, letterbox style, which is appropriate for the movie. Some special green screen shooting that we're going to do where Keir DeLay, Gary Lockwood, myself, Dan Richter, we can all walk right into the 2001 set and actually indicate to the viewer what's going on, why this is here, why that was the way it was. I think it's going to be a really interesting and novel approach to a documentary about the making of a movie that is so far back in history. It's a bit tricky. Yeah. We'd have to cut his higher brain functions. Well, that's far safer than allowing Hal to continue. We think it's going to be a documentary that really tells the story of the making of 2001. Not just the technical story, but the human story, the personal story, the experiences of people who interacted with Kubrick that is really true to the style and the look of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which still holds up today. It wasn't too long after we made 2001 that I went back to Los Angeles, where I was born. I'm an LA native. And um, it didn't take too long before I started developing some ideas for films of my own, because I was watching this master filmmaker. And I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> and it's not as simple as that, but it's part of who I am. And uh, so I started developing Silent Running, which um, 
I'm very proud of. It's a very small, intimate, uh, much more emotional, simple movie made for a little over a million dollars. And I'll show you a little clip from that movie just as a sample of what I call conventional filmmaking. This is what I was talking about. This is actors talking. This is dialogue. This is over the shoulder shots and cutaways and establishing shots. It's conventional cinema that will play. Uh oh. Is it playing or not? Uh oh. This video is not playing. Uh, so you're not going to see that video. But maybe you will. Let's see. Is that a start? Yeah. Oh, it's just it's starting there. I just don't see it here. Sorry. budget 32 day shoot to make this movie um, and my idea was to focus on the relationship between Bruce Dern who was the, the lead character in the movie and these artificially intelligent robots that he's anthropomorphizing and the story is about kind of empathy and an emotional relationship between man and machine and that's really the underpinning of what I was trying to do with this movie so you'll see these little drones in the movie, which, which were the precursors for R2-D2 in, in uh, Star Wars. So the idea was to do science fiction with heart. And I felt 2001 was cold in a way, very technical, but not very emotional, certainly. So that was my objective with this little movie. And these drones are performed by bilateral amputees. It was an idea that I saw when uh, I saw a movie by Todd Browning called The Freaks. And it had an amazing character in this movie played by a guy named Johnny Eck, who simply didn't exist below the waist. And I thought, well, this would be a really cool way to make a robot if you can't figure out how it's done. All the people are exactly the same. And what kind of life is that? Well, if it's a run, why do you want to go back? Because it's not too late to change it. <laughs> what do you want, blow? I mean, there's hardly any more disease, there's no more poverty. Nobody's out of the job. That's right. Every time we have the argument, you say the same thing to me, you give me the same three answers all the time, the same thing, well, everybody has a job, that's always the last one. But you know what else? There is no more of, my friend, there is no more beauty. And there's no more imagination. And there are no frontiers left to conquer. And you know why? Only one reason why. One reason why the same attitude that you three guys are giving me right here in this room today. And that is, nobody cares. seen this movie before? Thank you. Well, it's a story, it's kind of an ecological story of the storage of the last remnants of life on Earth in terms of plants and animals are in these domes in deep space for safety, to preserve them until some future time when they can be brought back to reseed the Earth. So it's kind of an ecology story and uh, it's an adventure and you'll see a little bit more of the drones.
not the kind of stuff we're talking about today, of the, the threat of artificial intelligence taking over human life and displacing all of us for any useful purpose. He's really concerned about the little guy here. And it's going to get swept off the deck of the ship by this cloud of gas from Saturn's ring. characters that he really had no choice but to kill because that was one of the characters that was going to destroy the domes and, and Earth would be left without any source of uh, trees or forests or seeds or anything else and so he's, he's feel, he feels like his conscience tells him there's a certain, he can't go that far, he can't let them do that and so he's actually killed this guy and he's feeling this tremendous remorse about him being caught in a situation where he had to kill somebody and didn't want to. And then but in this scene, I, I was working with Bruce Stern, and I'm learning to direct actors. He says, well, I'm a method actor. And I says, what the hell is that? He says, well, I take human experiences from my life and I transpose them into other scenes. And I, uh, when he's doing this scene, he's thinking about like the death of his own daughter who died in a swimming, died in a swimming pool accident. That's where he is in his heart. But he's saying the lines from the script. But I, that's I one of the things that's going on here. I really know how to say it. Wolf and Barker and Keenan. They weren't exactly my friends. But I did like them. And, uh... I don't think that I'll ever be able to excuse what it is that I did, but I had to do it. And That's all that I have to say. You can come him over now. That's movie making. That's what I call conventional storytelling, drama, emotion, pathos, sadness, all kinds of things that movies are made out of. And I'll get back to my technical side a little bit now because for 2001, we wanted the destination for 2001 to be Saturn because Saturn is such a cool looking planet with its rings. And no one could figure out how to make Saturn. And I figured it out later after we finished 2001 and I used it in silent running. It was a very cheap, it was just by, it was a light lathe. It was a, a rotational art piece, a couple of pieces of bent cardboard 
spinning 360 degrees during a single frame exposure to create Saturn and its rings. Cheap and easy. That's kind of part of my philosophy that I carry through today, which is what I call an organic technique of making films or making images for films. And I shy away from computer graphics because they often look synthetic to me. So I try to find ways to actually use miniatures and organic effects and tanks of water and dyes and weird phenomena that I find that are useful in making films. But these are all the miniatures we built for Silent Running. Um, and, uh, and then this is Cheryl Sparks who performed, she was one of four people who performed the drone roles. And here's, me, here's, here's what it's like to direct a drone which is unusual. And then uh, here's Johnny Eck, the inspiration for the drones. Uh, this was a front projection machine, which is very hard to understand, but basically it's a, it's a projector here on the left, a 45 degree mirror that's taking the image that's being projected and projecting it forward onto the set. And then behind the mirror is the camera. So the mirror and the projector are all on the same optical axis. And at the end of the set is a retroreflective screen made of 3M uh, re retroreflective beaded material that bounces that image back to the camera. So people can actually stand in front of it, but the projected image doesn't show up because it's projected on them, but they're filling their own shadow, and the image from, that hits the screen in the background uh, becomes very bright. So this is the stage where we're shooting the interiors of the uh, domes on, and there's a, that's the screen back there kind of covered with a drape. So we had a screen that we could roll around the set 360 degrees, no matter where, where we set the camera, we could move the screen and move the projector. And it was a way in the day of shooting composite shots, and it was very successful. So that technique was used in 2001, and if you read any articles about the making of 2001, it talks a lot about front projection. So now I'm gonna make a big leap in time and come to ShowScan. Um, after I made Silent Running, I was having a really hard time getting my next gig in Hollywood because it's a very tough town. It's a very competitive town. And I, was, I had develop, what's called development deals at all the studios. I had one at MGM, one at Fox, one at Warner Brothers, and one at Columbia. And they all kept falling away for really stupid reasons, which had to do with bad management at the studios. It wasn't, I don't think it was me, or not that we didn't have good ideas for movies, but it was a disaster and I was trying to make a living. And so I, I talked to my lawyer, I said, isn't there a way we could form an R&D company to try to make movies better, just fundamentally change the industry. And so I became very interested in exploring the future of cinema and immersion at that time, which was about 1974, quite a long time ago. So one of the things that came out of that was a thing called ShowScan, which was 70 millimeter film at 60 frames per second on very wide curved screens, kind of like Cinerama, but at a higher frame rate. And I'll show you a little video about ShowScan. I formed Future General Corporation to explore the future of cinema. We tried different film formats such as VistaVision, Todd AO, Super Panavision, and IMAX. We also shot tests at 24, 36, 48, 60, 66, and 72 frames per second. We attached sensors to the viewers in a laboratory, proving that high frame rates were the real key to improving human visual stimulation and creating a powerful sense of realism. We received a U.S. patent on what became known as ShowScan 60 frame per second 70 millimeter film. Suddenly the surface of the screen went away. It became like a 3D movie even though it was 2D. Frame rates got you to much more like what reality is with us right now. This led to the business development of the ShowScan process of 70 millimeter film at 60 frames per second. So, um, this didn't take off. Uh, it was very expensive in the sense that we used up two and a half times as much 70 millimeter film, which was twice as expensive as 35 millimeter film. So it was five times the film budget and five times the print budget. And Hollywood just wasn't going to go there. Even though we showed this to everybody in the, in the movie industry we could find and they loved it. And we found this fundamental thing about frame rates being critically important to a sense of immersion. And so all of you who are working in the world of VR probably know that 60 or 72 or 90 frames a second improves the sense of realism. And there's really no known upper limit to it. I know that certain driving simulators and things that are being used uh, are running at sometimes 400 frames a second. Uh, I'm, I'm presently exploring other higher frame rates and I'll explain that later. So um, 
brainstorm came out of the Future General Corporation when I showed Showscan to Paramount Management. And they said, whoa, this is so fantastic. We gotta make a movie in this process. So I said, fine, that's exactly what I would love to hear you say. So we started developing Brainstorm, which was a way of exploiting the, sh the, uh, the Showscan concept. So I'll show you a little clip of Brainstorm. And this is actually kind of a long clip, and I'll, I'll interrupt it as we go along, if it plays. So this is, this is my longest clip today. Uh, and I, because what I want to talk about during this clip is that I was exploring this idea of 70 millimeter giant screen immersive cinema. We couldn't shoot it in the process, but I did agree to make the movie conventionally. And so we shot part of the movie in 35 millimeter, part of the movie in 70 millimeter, and intercut them. So the shape of the screen would change, the movie would change from mono sound to stereo sound. And it was a very immersive experience, in spite of the fact that we couldn't do a higher frame rate. Has anybody here ever seen Brainstorm? I could. Not very many people have, but uh, maybe someday I'll make a sequel to this movie. Because I think it's a really good idea. Because the reason I'm showing it here and the reason I'm giving it so much time is that it's really predates virtual reality. And the idea I was exploring in this movie was to deal with the subject of human experience as a dramatic storytelling component. And so they're in this lab at the very early part of the film and the thing's not quite working right and so it's spinning around and they're trying to figure it out. But Chris Walken here who's in this giant, super cool, um, almost zero degree Kelvin, two ten micro Kelvins above absolute zero helmet is experiencing whatever the other guy sees or feels or smells or tastes. It's a real time feed, it's like a live television, from one person to another, brain to brain. Not eyes to eyes or ears to ears, but brain to brain. That was the whole idea okay, behind now. this Let's movie. Sleep. 44, sleep. So we were trying to suggest a whole diversity of content that could lead to the things that, that uh, uh, Cliff Robertson talks about, which is education and news and sports and music <coughs> and concerts and opera and drama that could be, they could bring a new level of immersion with the, with the technology like this. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Google or somebody figures this out and actually does this soon. So, I'm gonna move on. Um, we did a lot of weird visual effects in this movie, trying to kind of explore uh, immersive imagery, abstract immersive imagery, and then the tragedy um, happened where Natalie Wood died in an unexplained, uh, suspicious circumstance death. Uh, she drowned during the production of the film, and it was just hell on earth for me to get this movie finished. I'm not going to go into that long story, but um, I did get the movie done, and I'm very happy that I was able to get it done. And don't believe anything you hear about Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner and everybody else. It's not really the true story in my, my opinion. But getting back to this whole idea of making these helmets, which are kind of like the next Oculus Rift or the next Vive or the next whatever or the next uh, Google, is product development and trying to miniaturize these things to where they're smaller, less expensive. You know, the, the prices of VR are just dropping exponentially. And then the idea of what kind of experiences do you have that are extremely unusual a life after death experience or an out of body experience or a flying dream or any of the number of things one, one could imagine you could do. And uh, we were trying to touch on those in this movie. And doing it with fisheye lenses similar to what we did for 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is the camera we were using. And giving this kind of point of view shot which is very much like you would do with VR to have an extremely wide angle 180 degree view or more of some situation and letting the audience just watch it or be there. And so here's, you know, shooting a, a point of view of Christopher Walken when he's in a hospital after he's tried to play uh, the death tape and nearly died. What he didn't realize was that the autonomic nervous system was still in the tape and her heart attack gives him a heart attack. 
And he had, had to figure out how to disconnect that part of the autonomic nervous system in order to play the tape through without dying from it. So that's part of the story. So that's the point of view of the actors now talking directly to camera. And then some more of this extremely weird stuff, out of body stuff, because um, Louise Fletcher has her death scene right here where she dies uh, and makes a recording of her death and just starts having these really, when he plays the tape, it's very, very weird and abstract and otherworldly. And uh, here's me with Natalie Wood. I had a wonderful time working with her. She was a wonderful actress. And Chris is a fantastic actor as well. And uh, this is him playing Natalie's tape. There's a lot of stuff. There's a, the story of the reconciliation of their marriage was really an important part of the tape machine too because their marriage is breaking up because they're, they're having what you might call irreconcilable differences that are heading toward divorce. But he gives her a tape of his mind and she gives him a tape of her mind and they come back together again. So it's about it's kind of the opposite of a negative thing. It's more of a positive uh, and, and, and encouraging, uh, happy, happy kind of story. And uh, when he's playing uh, the death tape, it's really challenging and puts him into all kinds of states. And then here's back at where Cliff Robertson is playing the demo tape at the very early of the movie. And here's just me working with Natalie and Christopher and directing a movie. And here's Lillian's tape, which was this really weird, you know, it was, I was, I was thinking of it as kind of a quantum, quantum technology, not magnetic tape, but kind of electro-optical tape process. And when we made this movie, which was in the early 80s, we didn't know anything about you know, solid state devices very much or that we were heading toward quantum computing or anything else. So we thought of it as tape, um, which it would be totally obsolete in this today. But it starts leading to these really weird abstract visions of heaven or hell or both or uh, alternate reality kind of things. So I'm gonna end that part of this talk and start talking about the movie theaters and screens and projectors and seating. And so th we've been spending a huge amount of time at my studio uh, trying to figure out what's the next step for movie theaters. And so this is a kind of a graphic representation of a standard movie theater, which is shoebox shaped, narrow, long, a flat rectangular screen at the end of the room. Uh, and this comes from the early days of cinema when 35 millimeter film was projected at 24 frames a second onto a bed sheet or whatever. And uh, here's the top view, excuse me, here's a top view of the same thing. And then here's Cinerama, which was a deeply curved, cylindrically shaped screen, uh, which was very interesting and very immersive. And they did know that 24 frames a second wasn't good enough for their process. And so they actually increased the frame rate of Cinerama to 26 frames a second. They increased the image size on the film to six perforations instead of four. They were doing everything they could to make an immersive uh, movie experience. And then many years later, IMAX was invented, which was 70 millimeter or 65 millimeter negative, 70 millimeter prints, 15 perforations wide, 70 millimeter film using rolling loop projectors onto very wide screens. And IMAX was a very powerful giant screen medium. Uh, it's not the same today because IMAX went digital and actually downgraded the resolution. But we're finding out that 4K resolution actually can compete with 70 millimeter film of the past. What I'm doing right now, I'm calling it Magi. It's a deeply curved hemispherical screen. It's more like a flight simulator. And we're now doing five times the normal frame rate. So we're at 120 frames per second. We're 3D instead of 2D. We're shooting at 4K instead of 2K. And the field of view is wider than Cinerama was and wider than IMAX has ever been and wider than 70 millimeter was in my youth. And what this enables is almost unlimited camera motion or subject motion on the screen. There's no blurring, there's no strobing, the image holds together all the time. And stereoscopically, the stereo space is very, very deep. And so you feel like you're there. You feel like you're in the movie in a way. And so this is leading to um, my experiments in a kind of a new cinematic language. Uh, these are all kind of technical drawings of fields of view and um, curvature of screens, curvature of seats, trying to make an ideal movie theater, uh, which we're heading toward right now. And um, the, the, the quest that I'm on is to figure out if it's possible to make a fully dramatic 
feature length movie that is totally immersive at the same time and still tells a story and t still keeps you involved dramatically. And, and that's, the, that's the challenge that we're facing right now is how to get there. Now I'll go back for a moment to, to the moon beyond, which is a dome shaped screen. And that's like a planetarium. We made a movie in a planetarium, but it was a documentary film of a kind of a tour through the universe. And if you've ever been to a, a planetarium show, they're often tours through the universe or how the solar system works or how gravity works or how spacecraft get into orbit or whatever. But they never tell a story. Almost never do they tell a story in a dome. It's almost impossible. And so the seating in a dome is very challenging. The front seats, which are like in the front edge of the dome, are looking straight up. The back seats are looking forward. They're very hard to design these domes and very hard to tell a story. Because it's not a proscenium arch. It's not a rectangular frame in which you can stage performances. You can't do an over-the-shoulder shot in a dome. Who am I? Where am I? Why am I seeing over someone's shoulder in a dome? It makes no sense. So that's been a big struggle, and I'm going to explain to you in a few minutes um, what I did on the Back to the Future ride for Spielberg, which was to solve part of that problem. So ShowScan, which I was talking about a little while ago, had these deeply curved screens with 60 frames per second, 70 millimeter, ultra-wide angle lenses. And um, I thought it was a pretty powerful, immersive experience, but I realized in retrospect it was just a stepping stone toward the next thing, which I'm working on now, because we've made the transition from film to digital. I'm not interested in going back to film. I don't, I don't want to do that. There are some filmmakers who just think that 70 millimeter was the greatest, the greatest thing that ever happened, and filmmakers like Chris Nolan are completely stuck on film and don't ever want to touch a digital camera or a digital projector. But I don't think they're going to have any choice about it. So we couldn't get the movie industry to transition into it because the studio said, well, we'll make a movie, but where do we show it? And the exhibitors would say, we're not going to convert the theaters unless all the studios make movies. And so I was developing Brainstorm, which was a vehicle for ShowScan. At the time, the added cost of ShowScan's 65mm raw stock, processing, new projection equipment, and 70mm prints was a non-starter for the industry, and I was forced to make Brainstorm conventionally. This was a huge disappointment for me for many reasons. So I stopped writing and directing and began the long haul to find a new way to make movies that would be more immersive, more spectacular, and more involving than they are. So this led to studying cinemas, studying projection, studying cameras, studying lenses, and relating that all to the cinematic art form because I, I do think of myself as a film director, not just a special effects guy. And so we started toying with these ideas of immersive screens like flight simulators. So the screen would be deeply curved vertically and horizontally, uh, and even more curved than the Cinerama screens were. And we started designing these hemispheric screens. This is one of them under construction. And this led to a new business which fell out of the Back to the Future ride, and I'll explain the simulation ride idea. So simulation rides uh, were you know, immersive cinema plus the physical stimulation of being on a, what's called a motion base, which is a hydraulic device that replicates the motion of an airplane, for instance. In this case, the idea I was developing was to trans, transfer flight simulation technology to storytelling drama. And I developed the first simulator rides, and it became the Back to the Future ride. And prior to that, we did the Star Tours ride at the CN Tower in, in Toronto, and then that got copied by Disney, which became the Star Wars ride, which is still running today, which is 70 millimeter film in a motion base, like a 40 passenger mo moving theater on hydraulics. And then um, I did a bunch of attractions at the Luxor Hotel, which includes simulation, learned a lot more about simulation. And then this, uh, this is the 40 passenger flight simulator that we built for Tour of the Universe and Star Tours. And there was this funny kind of camaraderie competition between Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, because George Lucas ported Star Wars into this flight simulator and was hugely successful. That was my idea of, of, of doing it. And um, Spielberg wanted to have his own simulation ride that was better and better than Star Tours. So that became the Back to the Future of the ride. So. Um, I won't name the people who first got the job to work on Back to the Future ride, but they were trying to make a film for this ride about 
Back to the Future trilogy of movies, they were failing miserably because everybody that came to look at it threw up. And they didn't realize that they had gone into this kind of a trap of not understanding how to coordinate the motion of the camera to the motion of the vehicle and, and synchronizing physiological body stimulation to what you see. So what you feel and what you see has to exactly match. If you don't match them, people are going to get sick. Anyway, we figured that out, and a lot of the things that I developed in the making of the Back to the Future ride were just really fun. It was a huge challenge. There was nothing but problems. And we had to figure out, well, how do we tell a story in this totally immersive experience based on, on a trilogy of movies? And so we had to figure out, well, how to, you know, how to hide the lights. When you're shooting with fisheye fish lenses, there's no light stands or microphones in the shot. You can't do that. Um, there was tremendous blurring and strobing at 24 frames a second. And if you tried to move the camera, it just went boo, 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 across the screen really badly, blurred and strobed. And it was uncomfortable. And so we had to design a story that would solve that problem. And we had no computer graphics at the time we made this ride, so we had to do it all electro-optically. We had no compositing or, or computer graphics. Um, and there was no, so there was no way to superimpose actors into the sets in the movie. We couldn't do it. There was no optical way to do it. We had no technology to do it. It's very commonplace in movies these days, but then it was impossible. So I had to figure out, well, how can I tell a story and create drama in a simulator ride that's an eight-passenger DeLorean car surrounded by this 180-degree hemispheric movie that's a flight through the past, present, and future? So one of the things I, I suggested, let's put a, a big video monitor right on the dashboard of the car that's a live feed from another car that we're chasing. That was part of the story idea. So the, the story I concocted was that Doc Brown has got to chase Biff, who has stolen his DeLorean car and is messing with the space-time continuum, and we've got to stop him right away. So that was the, it sort of became a chase movie. And another part of that idea was by having a foreground object that we're following, there was always something in the shot that wasn't blurred or wasn't strobing or wasn't wasn't blurry. And so it became a chase movie. And because of cross-reflectance in a dome, which is horrendously bad, you know, if something bright is on one side of the dome, it just reflects over to the other side of the dome. And so black on the other side of the dome is no longer black, it's just gray. And then color saturation is very low in domes because the surface area of a dome is so huge in terms of square footage, you can't light it up very brightly. So it's only three foot Lamberts instead of a standard of 15 for the movie industry. So it's very dim. So we had all these problems to figure out. So I looked at every IMAX movie I could in a dome theater until I figured out what were the best shots and kind of designed the story. I wrote the story backwards to make a movie that would avoid all the pitfalls of projecting in a dome and 24 frames and low resolution and low brightness and storytelling. And we concocted this ride. So this was a humongous success. And this is what convinced me that we can actually make fully dramatic storytelling movies in a, in a completely immersive environment, even if the technology at the time is, ha, has some shortfalls of the problems I just listed. But the Back to the Future ride was in three parks. It was one in Los Angeles, one in Orlando, Florida, and one in Osaka, Japan. And the rides consisted of 12 DeLorean cars parked in a dome. And there were two domes side by side, so there were actually 24 DeLorean cars running all day, every day, throughout the entire operation of the park, seven days a week, 10 or 12 hours a day. And so I roughly calculated that they probably made $2 billion on this four-minute ride. That, that was like a humongous wake-up call for me. Because any of you who study video games, for instance, you know that the video game business is much larger than the movie business. It may be larger than movies and sports and music combined. I don't know, but it's big. And so taking into account the business aspects of how do you, how do you create revenue, a revenue stream and a business model in an immersive world is the trick. And it has to do with throughput of people, thousands and thousands of people. So we could do, we actually had over 115% of park capacity at the parks because people would ride the ride multiple times. They'd keep coming back and ride it again and ride it again. And so we were capturing a huge audience. The rides were full all the time. And I just allocated $5 to each ticket. And I said, well, they probably made $2 billion. 
So we solved all these problems of uh, cross reflectance and being dim and 24 frames being inadequate. Uh, we solved the problem of blurring and strobing and nausea and it ended up being this ride that cost about $65 million to Universal. And the film itself, the four minute movie, cost $14 million. So I hope you guys are all ready for the next step in your lives of VR and AR. You've got to step up to making dramatic movies and telling stories in VR. And you have to start thinking about, well, what are the normal budgets on a television episode? Or what are the normal budgets for a feature film? How do you hire actors? How do you talk to actors? How do you get actors to act? How do you direct actors' movements in 360? You've got a lot on your plate to solve, and yet I think it's all doable. And I think we're headed toward a completely new convergence of VR, AR, and motion picture storytelling. So this was delivering a four minute movie experience. Fortunately for us, almost everybody who came to the ride had seen the movies. So they knew about Biff, they knew about Doc Brown, they knew about the whole plot and what was going on and who was chasing who and who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. So they came prepared, which is also an important thing. We call it a pre-show. And it's common in the theme park industry that while people are bored to death waiting in line, you gotta show them what, about, what they're about to see. You gotta train them and bring them up to speed on what the issues are in the story. It was a real epiphany for me, it was the Back to the Future ride, which Steven Spielberg asked me to direct. And they couldn't quite figure out how to make it work, and so they asked me to try to solve these problems for the Back to the Future ride, and I said, that's exactly something I think I can contribute to, and I directed it wrote and produced the Back to the Future ride for Universal Studios Tours, and that to me is a piece of cinema. We really achieved a kind of super intense virtual reality. going to tell you a quick little story that happened at the very beginning of the project, which was a complete shock to me. Even though I had, my idea was the simulation ride concept, which I developed at Paramount years before, they took me into this lab and said, well, you know, we know, we normally ask a director how much footage, how much raw stock you need to shoot in your movie. What is your shooting ratio? Is it 1 to 1, 10 to 1, 5 to 1, 20 to 1? But they didn't ask me that. They asked me how many pounds of hydraulic fluid do we need per minute? And I said, well, I don't know. So I had to do this test. I had to actually mock the whole ride up ahead of time and think, well, this is going to be a real high action scene, and this is going to be a calm scene, this is going to be kind of a cruising scene, and this is going to be a sudden impact, and hypothetically make a ride for four minutes, program that into the motion base so they could calculate how many pounds of pressure they needed on this motion base filled with sandbags that represent the weight of the average American. And so it led to this crazy ride, and then mocking up the ride uh, in my studio in Massachusetts, here, in this, when I moved to Massachusetts. And then the 70 millimeter, 15 perf rolling loop IMAX projector, which was used. And a gigantic dome screen, kind of like this. And then this was our little screening room with a door and car and a 30 foot diameter dome, uh, so we could see dailies. 
dailies are seeing what you just shot. You know, when you shoot something in video, you can see it right away. You can see it in real time. In film, you've got to process the film. So at my studio, I actually build a 70 millimeter film laboratory to process black and white reversal film so we could see a positive print of our tests within two hours while we were shooting. So we would shoot a profile of the camera moving through a miniature, take that out, process it, put it into this projector, and put it on this motion base, and make sure you didn't throw up. Because <laughs> there was a fine line between throwing up and being thrilled. It's another bit of art form that I think is worth knowing more about. So this was kind of a side view. There's 12 cars in there, several rows of cars, all looking at the same screen, which had its own problems, because you're looking at the screen from different distances. Like the ones in the lower corner are looking at the screen from too close. It's like theaters that build seats that are too close to the screen. And then there are 12 cars inside this dome. And then this is uh, Hill Valley. I want to show you these quickly. Uh, these are just stills from the movie that I scanned and behind the scenes shots of the camera rigs and a little sense of scale. That's the art director. Um, that's me. This is the guy who built the miniatures. Here's on the set. Uh, a lot of the illustrations for the storyboards of this ride were made by Ralph McQuarrie, a very brilliant illustrator who actually designed Star Wars. And we got him to work on Back to the Future of the Ride, because Spielberg is very close to George Lucas, and George said, yeah, sure, take, take it. And we had to build a robot, because we had no computer graphics. Uh, ju uh, Jurassic Park hadn't even been thought of yet. So we had to build a 64-channel robot dinosaur, and filmed it. And we had to design it so that the dinosaur was big enough, and the camera was small enough to fit the camera in the dinosaur's mouth. That's one of the scenes we wanted to have. And we built these motion control rigs, uh, the one on the right has got very thin little uh, wires coming down and holding the, the, the DeLorean car, and the one on the left has the, 60, the 70, 65 millimeter 15 perf IMAX camera, and they're all shooting one frame every 10 seconds. It was all very slow motion control because we had to stop the camera down to F22 to have depth of field. So we're not going to go into much more detail about the making of the movie. It was just a heck of a lot of fun. We built this giant lava tube. It was had like 10,000 gallons of, of strawberry shake from McDonald's, <laughs> methyl cellulose and, and yellow, orange dye and lights and the DeLorean car. And it was, it, the whole thing was just a riot. And building all these mountain ranges and things and trying to find out where to hide the lights and get this magical lighting effect and do this ice crevasse that we fly into and then I, I could go on and on about it. And then this giant crash landing where Biff, Biff is finally caught, is brought back to justice, and gets out of his car, and they hose it all down. And one of the effects we used for the ride was that when the ride begins, you, the audience member, are taken into Doc Brown's private garage where his car is parked. And no one notices that there's no ceiling in the garage because it's dark. Everybody gets into the eight-passenger passenger door and car, the Goldwing's door closes down. The lights go out, and then a wall of CO2 comes over the, the hood of the car to mask the fact that the, the entire car is going to be lifted on a hydraulic lift up into the dome theater before the motion starts and before the film starts. And then at the very end, a guy comes up to the camera and hoses it down with CO2 because he's chilling the car down because it's much too hot having to travel through the space-time continuum. Uh, and then the car descends back down, and then the, the CO2 goes away, and you're back in Doc Brown's garage. So that was storytelling from beginning to middle to end, using physical effects, dynamic physical motion, projected imagery, video, 64 channels of sound, and tons of visual effects and photography. That's Biff getting caught, and this, excuse me, this is the camera that we had to build for the show. That's a 65 millimeter, 70 millimeter camera that shot one frame at a time. And so it had an 180 degree wide Zeiss lens shooting this 15 per 70 millimeter film, one frame at a time, several seconds per frame exposure. And these are just frames out of the movie. These are frames from the action, actual print of the movie. And we had so much fun crashing into things. We thought, well, we gotta, we gotta be like VR, we gotta avoid things. I said, no, let's not avoid things, let's just smash them to bits. 
And that was so much fun because we could smash into something like we smashed into this Texaco sign at a gas station and blast right through the sign. And that's when the motion base goes, oh, you know, you'd have this hydraulic force making you feel like you really hit something physically. It would scare the hell out of people. So we had a lot of fun. You hit the clock tower, the clock flies apart, you go through time and space, and you come to all these different locations for the movie, including this crazy uh, set that we designed, which we called the Cinderpire set, which was kind of a weird volcanic eruption place inside of a volcano with this 64 channel robot dinosaur. And uh, of course, he eats you. And you had to get in there. Then, then you get, you escape, you go down the lava tube, and you have to crash into Biff's car to get Biff to come back out of the space-time continuum, and that's the end of the story. So that's storytelling in a nutshell in four minutes. So now I'm going to make another leap in time and space to closer to where we are right now, and I will show you some things that were maybe six years ago, and we are developing a new kind of movie theater for this new digital film process I'm working on. And the idea is a, a, a deeply curved hemispheric screen like I was showing you earlier and shooting in 4K digital at 120 frames a second in 3D and projecting it at four, four, 14 foot lamberts, which is normal industry brightness standard in order to see color. You don't get any color saturation if it's not bright enough. And this just solves so many problems of having an immersive experience that's theatrical and cinematic. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of that. To get today's audiences to be engaged by what a truly immersive entertainment experience can be, we've designed the ultimate movie theater for an immersive movie experience, the Magi Pod. They're 20 feet high and occupy 900 square feet. The pod is a prefabricated theater that seats 40 viewers. The field of view you generally get when watching an iPad is about 25 degrees wide, similar to a television screen. The field of view in a conventional movie theater is about 50 degrees wide, depending upon where you sit in the theater. The Magi Pod is equipped with a hemispherically curved Torah screen offering a field of view of more than 100 degrees wide, even more than Cinerama once offered. Although the screen is only 32 feet wide, the 3D effect is much more comfortable to watch than in a conventional theater because the pod offers the combination of high brightness, high resolution, high frame rate, and wide field of view, creating a much more immersive experience. In a traditional theater with a low gain flat screen, light cross reflecting off the screen is wasted to the floor, walls, and ceiling. With a curved high gain torus screen, more light reflects back to the audience, increasing the brightness of a 3D movie and dramatically reducing cross-reflectance. Unlike traditional theaters that can only provide three to six foot lamberts of light, Magi pods provide an image that is three times brighter, resulting in 16 foot lamberts. The pods house a Christie Mirage 4K projector capable of projecting movies in 3D, 4K, and at 120 frames per second. This projection system provides between five to 10 times the visual information of the industry standards of 3D movie theaters. Magi pods will have eye-catching architecture, lighting, and digital signage, and can also be custom designed to suit any site. We have designed these prefabricated modular theaters so that they can easily be introduced into thousands of existing interior space locations around the world, creating an entirely new exhibition industry. Any number of pods can be arranged to achieve any desired hourly capacity, rivaling larger theaters at significantly lower cost. Magi pods will be modestly priced and can be quickly set up in existing interior locations around the world, such as museums, special venue attractions like the Kennedy Space Center, the Grand Canyon, theme parks, water parks, zoos, aquariums, planetariums, trade shows, shopping malls, sporting events, historic landmarks, music festivals, cruise ships, and universities, offering an experience that is completely independent from the limitations of conventional movie standards and delivering an experience that is so real it seems as if there's no screen at all. Media technology and creativity, using our facilities and talents to push the envelope of immersive experiences and dramatic productions. Uvatog in the Magi process represents the future of moving images. So we 
made that little film at the end there is a, is a 10 minute demo film that we made to show this process in the pod. And it's a real breakthrough uh, experience because it's like virtual reality, but you don't have to have a headset on. You have to have 3D glasses, which are less, less intrusive. And you have completely surround 32 channel sound, subwoofers, extremely low subwoofers that go down to from 20 hertz to zero hertz that are vibrating the building. And it's a really cool, immersive experience. And we have it at our studio. And uh, if we could get together a, a bus tour or something, you could come down to the Berkshires and see what this all looks like. And it's pretty cool. And so it looks kind of like this. This is just a schematic of what the theater shape is like. But you can see that the screen is extremely wide and deeply curved and very evenly illuminated because we ray trace from the projector to the screen surface to the audience and make sure all that light is, is captured and corralled and reflected back. And so you get this um, extremely immersive experiential uh, movie, which is similar to what we did long ago, which was these deeply curved hemispherical screens for simulator rides. So um, this is kind of where we are right now, and we are moving beyond this, and I'll take you through some of the latest stuff. So my whole um, drive in making movies is how to get even further along that road of a first person experience to where the audience gets a chance to feel much more immersed in what's going on and much more personally involved in what's going on. And uh, I've been very frustrated by the nature of the motion picture process itself because, you know, motion pictures are very powerful. But they're really wonderful. They tell stories just great. And the standards of the industry, which really have been at like 35 millimeter film at 24 frames a second on a rectangular screen in a darkened room. That's a movie in a theater. And that started 90 years ago. And uh, what I realized that that standard was set, that 24 frame per second standard was set in 1927 to enable sound on film for the jazz singer. And that standard has been the same ever since. For this whole time, it's been the same. People have pushed away from that standard a little bit. Uh, Mike Todd, who was doing these, uh, the, these Todd A.O. movies, the giant 70 millimeter movies, realized that 24 frames was inadequate. He changed to 30 frames. He probably would have gone to a higher frame rate if there had been technology <coughs> to enable that at the time, but it wasn't possible to go much faster than that. So, Everyone who's done a giant screen movie, an epic spectacle, and even a Cinerama movie has realized that the 24 frames is not enough. And that if you had more frames, then there'd be less blurring, less strobing. You could have faster camera motion. You could have bigger stunt scenes and more action that wouldn't be all blurred and distorted. And everyone's been feeling that ever since. I mean, every cinematographer and director knows that you have to be very cautious about how you move the camera because it'll blur and strobe. It'll be very uh, annoying to the audience. You agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So, trying to reinvent the movie industry is no small task. Um, this is a lobby of a hypothetical theater that's made up of these spherical theaters of different sizes with different movies in them. <coughs> kind of a podplex instead of a multiplex. I hate multiplexes, by the way. I don't really start on that. And then there's the whole idea of virtual production, which we're continuing to use and explore. I've been doing it for 20 or 30 years, which is the whole idea that I'm sure you're familiar with is using a green screen or a blue screen and tracking markers and tracking systems in order to superimpose people into non-existent locations, whether they're computer generated or miniatures or live action or whatever. So a little bit about um, pre-production development on a film I'm hoping to make because I'm, I'm switching gears right now. Can I, fig I figure I've, I've de-risked this whole thing. I've proven to myself that it works. I'm showing it to people. Uh, everybody's welcome to come and see what it is. And the next thing for me is to get back to the filmmaking directing career that I set aside years ago uh, after Brainstorm because I was so frustrated that it's so hard to make a movie and so disappointing to see it shown so badly in crummy theaters. So this is a, a work in progress that's going on right now.
a screenplay for it is a big epic journey, kind of like 2001. It's a light ship that has to go 97 years to get to another star and find an exoplanet that's habitable. It's a colonization story. So it has some of the attributes of 2001 being a big epic adventure, but we're gonna shoot it this way so that these two actors are in a non-existent set. The set is being superimposed in real time. I can't show it here because it wasn't working the day we shot this. But what we see in the camera viewfinder is the finished shot while we're shooting in real time. So the Unreal Engine is generating the environment that these actor and actress are in. We see that in the viewfinder and then what's beyond the set that they're in, which is the exterior space outside of this space capsule, is also being generated in real time. And it's going to really accelerate the production of this film. So that's kind of our challenge. And these cameras here, these two cameras are side by side, so they're a normal human interaxial distance. The 3D that comes out of them is, is stunning. It's 4K 3D. And um, we're really happy with the results, because it, comparing it to what I started with when I was with IMAX, I took IMAX public in 1994. The cameras weighed 350 pounds. I tried to put that on the wing of an airplane. Uh, and so more recently I've been trying to develop dual lens cameras that are much smaller and lighter. This is an adaptation of a Phantom Flex 4K camera that could go 1600 frames a second in 3D. And so we've been developing that. And then we've been adapting industrial cameras um, to this Magi format because they're small enough to get a normal interaxial distance without having to have a beam split or any other Hanky panky to shoot 3D. And this is the, one of the closest cameras we've gotten to, which are these uh, Zimia cameras made in Germany um, with uh, Kawa lenses on them. And they shoot fantastically good, high quality imagery that can be put into the cockpit of a plane or on a skateboard or on a helmet. It's just like a GoPro for, on steroids. And so this has all led to us exploring this technology in perfect synchronism with the creative art form of telling a story and, and making a movie. So we made this little movie called Euphotog, which is a completely uh, fictional story about a, a man who wants to photograph UFOs and gets abducted in the process and, uh, you know, chased by the man in black and everything. But it, the idea was to make a demonstration film about 10 minutes long that was fully dramatic, that would have actors, dialogue, live action, computer graphics, digital compositing, interiors, exteriors, visual effects, everything that would go into a feature film, we had to show in this demo film in 10 minutes. So this is just a little bit of the production of this movie. Here at Trumbull Studios, we're shooting a demonstration film called Euphotone. And action. I was the lead new engineer on the SSN 23 Jimmy Carter. It is being produced at 120 frames per second in 4K 3D and we're using dual Canon C500 cameras mounted on a Reality TS5 3D rig, recording to codex recorders. Well, this was way before we came up with the new miniature. Our camera. studio is a laboratory where we can experiment, collaborate with world-class talents, and explore a new kind of immersive experience that goes beyond any film process ever known. There's Because I'm the only guy who's figured out how to get it. While the movie screen is two-dimensional, we're using this hyper cinema to make the audience believe that it is completely real. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Scenes in Euphotog involve the lead character photographing himself to report an extraordinary UFO event that he has set in motion. Our editor, Jeff Krebs, is working with us to explore what I call first-person cinema, allowing viewers to feel that they are inside the movie. Then, this leads to another issue, which is, if you're making a movie digitally, you're making digital assets. And those digital assets can be deployed, deployed in all kinds of different media simultaneously. Well, that's generally called transmedia. It's not a new idea. But you can, in theory, take all the assets that you're 
creating for a movie. All the environments, all the sets, all the props, all the locations, all the visual effects. And make a feature film, a dome dramatic movie for a planetarium, a television series, a, a virtual reality experience, an autom uh, augmented reality experience, or whatever, using those assets again, or at the same time or differently. So that's one of the ideas we're exploring, is how to bring all these worlds of simulation rides and theme park attractions and VR and AR and feature films and television into one space. <clears throat> that's led to kind of re revisiting the Back to the Future ride, which was a dome dramatic story. So why can't we have dramatic stories in planetariums? It's very possible. So um, these immersive experiences can be high frame rates, high resolution, now high dynamic range, which is quite a startling uh, improvement to the quality of imagery. You can have immersive sound, uh, any number of channels you want to have, uh, all kinds of sound, acoustic, sonic, dynamic range. And then the question, the question that I want to talk about tonight is, well, where are we going with all this and what's next? And so immersive experiences with dramatic stories. That's what I wanted to talk about because the world that's going on in VR and AR is not dissimilar to the world that I live in in the movie industry, but I see that there's, there's missing technology in the movie industry, but there's missing storytelling in the VR industry. And so we've got these different mediums that are all going on simultaneously today, which is um, 2K 24 frame per second movies in theaters that are flat, rectangular, and two-dimensional. Uh, we've got giant screen IMAX, which is still flat and two-dimensional, but it's changing to 4K and becoming what's called premium large format, or PLF, uh, which is everybody's copying IMAX because IMAX has had such, such tremendous success. I'll tell you a little bit more in a second, but um, what the, the PLF business is growing at the rate of 20% a year. People want immersive experiences in movie theaters. So they prefer the IMAX screen versus all the other smaller screens. But we've also got television, excuse me, television, what did I do there? Uh, 24 frames a second, um, trying to look cinematic. They don't shoot television, like Netflix and Hulu don't shoot at 60 frames because it looks too much like a soap opera. So there's this soap opera problem of trying to make them look cinematic. So they shoot at 24 frames, so it's like any other movie on a television. Seems like a movie, it's okay. Um, and then there's computer games, which are often at 60 frames, 72 or 90 frames a second, as is VR. Um, and you just can't get enough frames per second to make an immersive experience look good. So it's great, and it's really got great stereoscopic depth. And then there's AR, which is uh, coming along just fine, and it's going to get better and better and better, where the, the convergence of reality and, and fiction are going to collide and we're not going to know what's real anymore. Maybe. And then this Magi thing I'm working on, which is my answer to how to bring the movie industry by the bootstraps into the 21st century uh, and telling stories in a new way that's much more immersive. Um, and then we might do planetarium dome screens, and I'm developing a project for that right now for a, for a project with Virgin Galactic. So here we are. We have these mediums. Um, and then we have the coming of virtual reality. Not coming, it's here. Uh, and it's a first person experience. Uh, you control the pacing and where you are and what you want to see and what you want to look at. It's a, usually a contiguous, uninterrupted experience, which is completely antithetical to movies, which are based on cuts. A cut of her, a cut of him, a cut of the action, a cut of the hit, a cut of the car chase, whatever. Movies are dynamically changing as a result of cuts. Um, so figuring that out is not easy, but we did it in the Back to the Future ride. It was very successful. We had cuts in there, but you wouldn't notice them. Um, and we all want things that take us beyond the limitations of the physical everyday world that we're in. We want to go to outer space. We want to go inside an atomic particle. We want to go into the micro world of genetic, genomic developments, whatever. Um, and so um, how does virtual reality compete with movies? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, I think it's really an interesting question. Um, I'm on the advisory board of Magic Leap, 
and uh, they're trying to do mixed reality or what, what uh, Roni Abovitz calls uh, augmented or mixed reality. And then there's the, the, the game business, which is really driving uh, the future because Unreal Game Engine and Unity are really powerful tools to enable a very inexpensive graphics chip made by NVIDIA or whoever to get very close to photorealism. This is really important and important for games, important for VR, but also important to me as a filmmaker because we can now make virtual environments instead of building sets or going on location. This is really critically important to getting the cost of production down. And there's a lot of really cool new tracking systems um, to allow us to do that. So um, we're at this world of near real-time photorealism and extremely immersive experiences. Um, and here we are in the world of augmented reality, virtual reality. And it's changing storytelling. Um, the content and the storytelling art form have to be inextricably woven together. And, um, and I think we should use it to expand human consciousness and awareness and understanding of the physical world and everything in nature. And it, I think that all this is going to have a really profound positive impact on society if we don't use it badly or figure out how to use it to kill people. Um, you know, there's a very high rate of, I've heard there's a very high rate of suicide amongst people who fly drones, for instance. They get completely, there. it's like a video game that they, they don't realize until later that they're actually killing people. So that's, you know, one of the dynamics you have to deal with. But I think getting beyond the limits of the physical world is a big thing. And being life affirming and have profound experiential learning is a really important attribute of what you're doing and what I'm trying to do, which is how to make a completely new kind of uh, movie experience that's also life affirming and wonderful and spectacular and beautiful. So here we are with this pod that's at our little studio. It's a completely new kind of uh, motion picture experience. Um, one of the ideas behind, I'm not going to read all these, but it's the idea of a prefabricated theater was the only thing I could think of to be able to get a lot of theaters built in a short period of time. Because I have to wait for the movie industry. I'll be long in my grave before anybody does any of this stuff. So I figured, well, if we could prefabricate these theaters and reduce the cost to half what a theater costs, which we're doing, we have a really good shot at building a lot of these theaters and putting them all over the world. And that's colliding with or converging with the failure of retail. Because shopping malls are closing everywhere and leaving billions of square feet of empty space looking for a purpose. So we want to put entertainment in these empty spaces. We'll see if that happens. We're working on it. Um, so this is the pod and a bunch of happy campers. There's Julia right in the middle there. Um, here's some of the components of the pod, you know, high-end amplifiers, high-end speakers, super comfortable seating, super cool cameras, and we are really making something that's quite spectacular and uh, trying to, to benefit from all these new technologies to lower costs and increase impact. And this leads to us the cameras. Um, and this is leading to this light chip movie I was mentioning, which is a feature film I want to make. It's not the only film I want to make, but they're, the idea of t making a transformational movie that's like 2001 has the qualities of 2001 and the transformational first person nature of 2001, which is to take the audience on an adventure in space. I think we can do that better now than we did then. That was 70 millimeter, that was 50 years ago. The movie industry hasn't progressed very much in 50 years, sadly. So I'm trying to do this. So that's where we are. That's it. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. start a little bit later, so I would give another 15 minutes uh, for questions in the audience, if there is any. Uh, I'm seeing already two hands. I'll go around. We have another microphone, so maybe we can... Oh, thank you. <coughs> around, uh, there, there was two hands.
Hi, Doug. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, Brainstorm was one of my favorite movies as uh, a youth, a young teenager. I remember the theater that I went and saw it at uh, with this guy over here, my brother, and uh, I just want to thank you so much. Um, my pleasure. Uh, and um, I wanted to ask, I'm from Western Mass, and so I wonder, um, uh, did you, were you kidding when you said we could come visit the studio and uh, check out a demo? No, I'm not. I, okay. we could, it, I, I don't want you to come individually. I'd like you to all come at once so that we could we can handle 60 people at a screening. Okay. The screening is only 12 minutes long, but if you guys want to put together a bus ride or something, we can arrange it, right? Yeah. She's so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've done it all. We do it. We, we have people from our town. We have people from the industry. We have a lot of, as many people as we can get in the door is, is spreading, you know, word of mouth about what we're doing. So we're very welcoming to people to come and visit. Uh, hi, Doug. Thank you again for uh, coming out and being part of the speaker series. Uh, I think one of the big things that's always stood out to me, you, you, you talked a lot about the visuals, but especially in 2001 Space Odyssey, when uh, the scene that I always remember is when he's like, open the pod bay door, Hal, right? There's no real kind of like music, but there's still tension. Right, and I feel like the movie industry has moved to a point where you can't create tension anymore without a soundtrack. Or they kind of, for example, I guess obviously not to uh, compare, but in the recent movie, The Martian, right, where Mark Watney is out there, he's spinning around, you've got the music, and that cr kind of sets the mood. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you see the difference between setting a mood with the visuals and how the music plays into a part? Is the music necessary? Obviously, it wasn't necessary for 2001, but what are your thoughts on that? That's a big, big question, um, and a good question. Uh, my thoughts are that we're in a time where, because of the small screen in movie theaters and because of an even smaller screen on your TV screen and an even smaller screen on your smartphone, your mobile device or whatever, the industry creatively is using every tool at their disposal to, cry, to try to get you excited about it no matter how bad the medium itself is. And so they're goosing the sound effects, they're goosing the visual effects, they're goosing the editorial pace. There's more cuts per minute in these shows than you've ever seen in the history of cinema. In 2001, there's very few cuts per minute. There's time for things to evolve and play out more naturally. That's always been true of IMAX films, too, because there's so much spectacle on the screen, this particularly in the, in the years prior to the present, which was IMAX films in science museums, for example, of seeing a beautiful underwater scene or a beautiful space thing or the International Space Station or the Space Shuttle or whatever. You want to hang on those shots for a very long time and just kind of grok the fullness, so to speak. I really adhere to that, and, and that's one of the things I learned from Stanley Kubrick, is stick with one thing and do it really well, instead of just throwing every you know, kitchen sink at the audience and trying to get them stimulated. So those two worlds are separate, and what I'm finding is that in this world of um, extreme media, so to speak, that we're doing with, we have more resolution, more frames per second, more speakers. We can actually calm down a little bit and let the medium show you what's going on because a picture is worth a thousand words. And when you've got a thousand more pictures per minute, it's even better. Your, your, your nervous system absorbs it very, very naturally, just like we absorb nature and reality. So trying to find some sweet spot between those two worlds of extreme stimulation and, and beautiful music or sound effects or foley or whatever you want to make in your movie or whatever your cutting pace is, I think is yet to emerge. And the big challenge that I face as a filmmaker is that I'm talking to movie studios that are very caught up in the paradigm that they're in and they're teetering on whether they're going to stream movies or make movies for theaters. And that's even worsened by the fact that the management at most of the movie studios don't, didn't come from the movie industry. They're bankers from Wall Street. And so they don't have much of an imagination. They're very hard to talk to. They're very hard to convince of anything. And their, their kind of role in life, I think, is, is kind of 
how do they get Brad Pitt together with a good script and a good director and pray? Because they don't really know how it's done. So I, I don't know how to answer your question any more than that. Uh, but I, th it's, it's, I gotta tell you, from my perspective, it has been extremely disheartening and challenging and enervating to try to break the mold of the movie industry and then do something different. Because I don't get any help from anybody. Hi. Um, I was wondering why did you decide to design a new pot and why not design new glasses or design something immersive with for glasses? Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against glasses. I'm just not a product designer myself. And um, I come from the movie industry and I understand what you're saying about glasses. I've seen a lot of really great VR that's quite amazing and it's stereoscopic and it's the resolution's getting better and better and better and the latency is going down and the frame rate's going up. Um, but it's one person at a time. And I look at it as a kind of a business issue which is how many dollars per viewer do you have to spend to entertain them? And in the movie industry, 50 cents for a pair of throwaway 3D glasses is, is breaking their bank. They can't stand it. But asking each viewer to view a movie using a $1,000 computer or a $600 pair of 4K 3D glasses is like not, they have no appetite for it at all. So I think it's, a, it's trying to find a balance between cost and revenue and seeing it as a business. Uh, so I'm just, I just love the idea of a whole bunch of people being in one room in a darkened room simultaneously, all laughing together, crying together, being socially together. I think that's a social media of itself. And it's not isolating in the same way that VR is. I, I, could, I think it's really weird to see myself when I'm in VR because I, I, I look like a doofus, you know, wandering around in the dark. Uh, so, I can't, so I can't answer that really. I just, I love both of these mediums. I'm trying to figure out where's the sweet spot between the two of them, or will these two mediums kind of converge in some way? That's kind of the theme of what I'm trying to talk about. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, thank you so much for this inspiring lecture that has been so eye-opening. Uh, and congratulations for your career. It's just amazing. Um, thank you. What I uh, like to ask you, since you are really involved with Magic Leap, for example, in the last issue of PC World, in uh, March 29, they say, magic, sure, but augmented reality is still a long way away from mass consumption. And they claim that they have lost around $3 billion in investment. More. So, or more. <laughs> so my concern is, um, what's your perspective of augmented reality and virtual reality in companies? Because it seems that none of the companies available outside are doing business. So maybe they are going to disappear or what's going on? I don't know. I, I can't tell you what's going on. It's a really good question. I think it's really to the heart of the business thing I was just talking about. Like I was with, I'm, I took IMAX public. I, I was in, in, instrumental in finding investment bankers and bringing IMAX out of the, out of the museum business into the, the feature motion picture industry. We raised $300 million on Wall Street to do that. And that went really well. So that taught me, oh yeah, there's a market for that and the audience really likes it. They really approve it, they show up to the theater and they wanna see it. So that went really well. Um, when, it comes, when it comes to these other issues of you know, business and cost and everything, I don't know what the answer is. And I don't know, I mean I know that IMAX explored VR, they thought that was the next cool thing and it failed, they closed their VR centers. I don't know what other VR centers are doing well, and I think that well, there's, there are some fundamental problems attendant to entertaining one person at a time. Movies entertain thousands or millions of people at a time. It's a huge industry with 40,000 or more movie theaters, and they can make you know, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars in a weekend. So it's a completely different business model. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to harness that and do it better because I'm just a filmmaker. I want to make a good movie and I want to put it in a good place and I want it to be seen by people so they can experience what I had on my mind. Um, I don't know where to go, to go with it beyond that, frankly. I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. Sorry. Hi. Um, 
I'm um, a VR maker, and um, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit more about this convergence of storytelling and experience making, which is definitely something that um, I've been thinking about a lot when making VR. Because um, I've been to um, endless talks um, about kind of directing the attention of, of where you should be looking, where cuts should be, and it seems to me it completely misses the point, because VR in particular is, is 360. You're, you're inviting people to be distracted. It is more experiential. And yet, um, particularly people coming from filmmaking backgrounds are trying to have dramas in one place and get you to look at that one particular place. Right. And we don't seem to be able to really break away from the storytelling part um, very easily. And so I guess, as you've been, th I mean, I, th I think that the, the, the ride you, that you, you showed us is the best example of kind of storytelling and experience making coming together. But I wondered if you thought more, I mean, when you've got a kind of 180 screen, you can still kind of direct people's attention. But the yeah. minute you open it up to 360, you don't, you don't have that control of attention. So when you're thinking about this kind of convergence of cinema and theatre together or experience and storytelling, how are you thinking about what that should mean for VR makers who've got that entire field and what that, what that means for storytellers? Um, that's a really big question. I think that we have to define what is storytelling. And I think about it as experience making, as different from storytelling, experience making. But I also think about all the obvious really great humane and humanitarian applications of VR in medicine, education, experience, travel, you name it, all the stuff that's really cool that's fine as a one-on-one -on -one or do-it-your-home singular experience. And I've had many mind-boggling VR experiences that I thought were really beautiful and super immersive and, and, I, and gave me really weird transformational experiences. Like I was in one, that, I was up in Montreal that was the thing that we were at. And there was a thing called uh, spheres of planets and stuff. And I'm up there in the universe looking around 360 degrees, up, down, look around, and I felt like I had become a singularity. I had become a single point of consciousness in the universe. I thought, wow, that's major. I've never felt that in a movie. I've never felt that in any other circumstance. And I thought that was really profound. So I've been approached about our technology to teach surgery, for example. For example, the, the surgeon is the only person who can see what's going on in someone's heart because everybody else in the room is looking at it from an oblique angle. I said, what if we could have our cameras inside somebody during a live surgery and other hundreds or thousands of other people could experience that simultaneously in real time. While the surgeon is saying, I'm doing this because of this, and I'm doing the surgery because of that, and this is the tricky part, watch out right now, because if I do this wrong, this person is gonna die. All those kind of things are so profoundly interesting and important socially. Much more important than telling some stupid story about somebody chasing somebody. I think movies are you know, often really idiotic. Um, so don't get me started on that. <laughs> I just think VR is, needs to find its best use. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I'm not sure that dramatic storytelling is it. I, I, I'm really confused by the idea of trying to direct a movie in 360. I don't know what to do. It's like, too, it's like, it's like my experiments are hard enough, but compounding that difficulty with 360 is like, where do I get the budget to do that? No one, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. So. I'm up for it. If you have the money, I will give it a try. Uh, because telling a story in 360 and having you as a viewer feel as dramatically involved or in as much tension or as much love or as much fear or as much whatever that movies do, doing that in 360, I think would be really interesting. I just haven't done it. I, don't, I haven't quite seen it yet. This is kind of a message to the audience in that I've spent many hours in Doug's theater uh, experiencing what he's doing, and it's truly what he says. Uh, it, it's better than headphones. It's anywhere you, where you sit. It's an incredible experience, um, 
and it, it, it's a storytelling just being immersed in his experience that he's providing people. I'm using the opportunity. <laughs> I'm using the opportunity because we've had you uh, for two hours already, mm -hmm. and uh, I know some of. I knew we need to leave the room, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to find a way to make sure we can close it off without closing anybody. But w feel free to come and talk to Doug if you have some questions. By the way, the speaker series this year, the last one before you uh, was uh, Spheres, the producers and director of Spheres. So we are very much into. Uh, discussing with explorers of these spaces. I also heard this morning by Skype with our next guest from DV Group that you are also mm -hmm. in the board, uh, advisory board of uh, DV Group. If you're wondering what DV Group does, so they will be our speakers on April 21st, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what DV Group does is immersive theater mixed with VR, mixed with cinema, and I'm really, really happy to hear that you're on board. Uh, They're doing fantastic work. Because I really do see a curve in the way we perceive how virtual reality is going to mm -hmm. be heading to. And you've explained it uh, beautifully. Being alone in a headset is fun. It allows you to explore things differently, even interact with objects differently. But it's a very lonesome experience. So finding ways to explore these spaces yeah. together with others is really the, the way forward. Yeah, they did a, a show. Like, do you, what was the name of the show they did that was about uh, the what? Horrifically real virtual reality? Is this the one? Well, it was a, I'll take a minute and just say that it was one of the most amazing and immersive theatrical experiences I've ever seen. Because I was with maybe, what, six or eight people? Six people? In a little group, mm -hmm. all seated together, all with headsets on. And we had been, there was kind of a pre show that set it up that we were in the laboratory of this crazed filmmaker who made the worst movie of all time, which was, what was his name? Ed Wood. Ed Wood. And so <laughs> that was the setup. So you're going to watch him at work. And you're there waiting for all this to happen. And then suddenly you're, you're looking around. You see hundreds of other people seated, like you are, in this same space, in this same theater, watching this crazy story unfold to the point where you can get up out of your seat and supposedly walk into the set and become part of the movie and interact with live actors. So part of the problem of it as a business was that it took quite a few human beings to perform this show because they were doing performance capture in real time of a character. So that was one paid actor who you know, you're interacting with. So you can shake hands with them and talk to them. And it was an incredible experience. And then you go outdoors and go through in a cemetery and you find all this crazy stuff going on. And it was really, I've never felt transported like I was in that. So the DV group is doing outstanding work, and I hope you guys can see it, and we'll see what happens next. I'm not interacting with them yet. I'm just signed up. I said I love you guys, and <laughs> count me in. We'll figure out what to do together. But I think there is a perspective for the future. We've been hearing about virtual reality already for at least a good four to five years. That's not when it started, just that it's everywhere. Um, and since. We really see a push in the way the medium is perceived as something, an art form of its own, and something to be explored, not just with headsets, but also onboarding and outboarding. So experiences and storytelling and experience sharing from the beginning to the end, including what you see inside and outside of headsets. But that also includes explorations of curved screens, immersive theaters. Mm -hmm. And I think your pod idea really speaks beautifully to uh, the need for space where we can gather around these new immersive experiences and spaces that can move, that are also easily transportable or can be moved from one location to the next. I think this w was a wonderful, really wonderful mm, event. Thank you. I'm, I saw the, the excitement and the, the gazes uh, during the talk too. So I'm really happy you guys were here. I hope you've enjoyed this. And please come for our next speaker series, of course. And I'd like to give a, a nice last end of applause for Mr. Trumbull. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.